So if you're not prepared to possibly be injured or maybe even killed, don't step foot on those boats. Ueda Araf is a human rights activist, lawyer, and co-founder of the International Solidarity Movement, also known as the ISM. It is a Palestinian-led movement committed to resisting the Israeli occupation in Palestine using non-violent methods and principles. The group received international attention when they sent a flotilla of boats carrying aid to Gaza that was intercepted by the Israeli Navy. My parents made their way to the United States when my mother was about eight months pregnant with me and now I'm the oldest of five children. They figured that they needed to get out. They needed to find a place where they can raise a family and give their children opportunities that they didn't think they would be able to give them. Either living in Melia, where we're not equal citizens, or living in Bitsahur where uh, under full Israeli military occupation. So I was born and raised in the United States. And I got my education here. I think I got a pretty decent education and I know and I feel that I've had opportunities that most of my people don't have to this day. And so when I finished my undergraduate degree from the, I studied at the University of Michigan, I decided to go over to Jerusalem. At that time, this was in the spring of 2000. We were still in this era of the Oslo peace process. You had Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin at the time and the chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization Yasser Arafat and on September 13th, 1993 on the White House lawn they shook hands. Things were starting to look bad but still you know we were working on it and I went to work for a conflict resolution organization. It's a US organization but it works in different regions of conflict and specializes really on Israel and Palestine. About five months after I got to Jerusalem and was working for this organization, the Palestinian, the Intifada, broke out. I think most of you might know. But on September 28, 2000, Ariel Sharon, who was an Israeli general, he was a leader of the opposition at the time, he decided to go up on Haram al-Sharif, or what Israeli Jews call the Temple Mount. And not only was this a, it considered very disrespectful by Muslims because it is their holiest site in Jerusalem, in Palestine, and the third holiest site in the world for Muslims. But it was, always a, it was also a very politically provocative visit because the message was, Eretz Israel is for all the Jewish people. We can go anywhere we want, even if it is your holiest site. And he went up on Haram al-Sharif, taking with him approximately a thousand soldiers, police officers, armed guards, and made this statement, which of course enraged people. So the next day, demonstrations took to the streets, and Israeli forces came at unarmed demonstrators with lethal force. So on the first day of unarmed demonstrations, seven Palestinians were killed. This sparked more rage. The casualties were much higher in the West Bank and Gaza, so that within the first month of these unarmed protests, 143 Palestinians were killed. Going back to our first intifada, which was 1987 to 1993, the Palestinian people launched a very a strong people's resistance, an effective nonviolent resistance, they led a very powerful anti-occupation resistance movement. And that came to an end in 1993 when Palestinians and Israelis signed the Oslo Peace Accords. And this was supposed to enter us into a new era of peace in the Middle East, and everyone hailed it as this big breakthrough. And even Palestinians were very optimistic. But what happened in the seven years from 1993 to 2000 is that Israel continued to build settlements which are colonies that sit on occupied Palestinian land. Checkpoints increased, and home demolitions continued. 
So Palestinians would complain about this during these seven years, but they were always told to be patient because we're in a peace process. Combine that with the fact that Israel came at people with lethal force, people were killed, no one held Israel accountable for Palestinian deaths. Again, it's not like we're afraid to die or sacrifice, but what is the effect? We're being blamed, we're not obviously not getting a message across, and nobody holds Israel accountable. So this is why these demonstrations died down. So most Palestinians can't take part in an armed struggle. It was a very small percentage of the population that did take part. And of course, the casualty rates continued to climb. Here's me at the time, probably rather naive, but thinking there's got to be something I can do about this. And so myself and a few other people, some Palestinians, a dear Israeli friend of mine, and some internationals, we ended up founding what's called the International Solidarity Movement today. The idea was maybe we can call people from all over the world, and they'll come and stand with us. And like my dream, we can form this massive civilian army, thousands of people linking arms and preventing the Israeli military from invading Palestinian villages and towns. At the same time, would this really work? Would anybody come? I mean, I know that my parents were calling from the States, they're still living in Michigan. My mother crying, saying, come home, because of the images that she would see on TV. And I told her, Mom, I feel I am home. I can't leave. But that's me, because I'm a Palestinian. I mean, would someone that's not Palestinian or not otherwise connected leave the comforts of their own home to enter what looked like a war zone on their own time and money using their own resources and energies? We didn't know, really, but we decided that we had to try. And so we sent out emails and announced that we're going to have this two-week campaign and we're going to work on Palestinian freedom of movement. Fifty people came and they joined us in this campaign where we marched on checkpoints, where we dismantled roadblocks. For two weeks we worked on this and then these people that came went back home and they told their friends and family about what they had done. And then they started asking us, well, when's your next campaign? And so we said, yeah, let's organize another campaign. And now to this day, it's about nine years now, we've had about 7,000 people from over 30 different countries come. In the beginning, we were also able to send volunteers to Gaza. Now, Gaza is physically separated from the West Bank. We'd send volunteers down to Gaza, and they would you know, show their passports. You enter, it's like you're entering another country. It's not another planet. It's this huge military compound. You have to go through you know, the Israeli military and get checked, but you were allowed in. And our volunteers in Gaza, they couldn't do the same thing we were doing in the West Bank because the situation was quite different in Gaza. And in a sense, a lot more dangerous. Because in a lot of places that came under Israeli fire, you had automated machine guns. You had drones that were unmanned that would fire. And so, you know, when we marched in the West Bank, you can see the soldiers somewhere in front of you. Maybe you can get close enough where you see the soldier face to face, where you can look into his or her eyes. In Gaza, no. In the center of Gaza, yes, you had soldiers controlling movement. But where the fire came from, no. So now Israel was getting a little bit of bad press because they had mortally wounded or killed internationals that had names, that had faces, that had governments behind them. I mean, never mind the thousands of Palestinians killed or injured by that point. So what did Israel decide to do? Internationals can't go into Gaza anymore. Of course, they couldn't completely ban people from, from going in. So what you had to do is, at least five days ahead of time, you had to apply for special permission. And you had to give a reason for wanting to go, and Israel had to approve of this reason. And these reasons fell generally into two categories. One, you were a journalist for an agency that was Israel recognized, you were registered with their foreign press office, or you worked for an international organization that Israel chose to recognize, the UN, the ICRC, or a host of other organizations. These people would get permission to go in. ISM, we couldn't get permission to go in at all. 
So we were cut off from Gaza for a while. So some of us from the International Solidarity Movement started thinking, what can we do about this? Here's the question again, what do we do? How can we change the situation? We didn't have access by any of the land borders. So one of our volunteers who was back home in Australia sends us an email and he says, you know what, this might sound crazy, but I've been thinking about it a lot, and I think we should sail a boat to Gaza. It's not that we thought we could really get into Gaza, but the idea was the whole world should see. It's not about security, it's about punishing the people there, cutting them off from the rest of the world, and we hope that that might shake the world to action. That was the idea. So we had to get a boat. Come spring of 2008, we still didn't have the money, but again, when this, these reports, and especially the stunted growth came out, we thought, we can't wait any longer. We have to go this summer. So what we did is we just dug into our own pockets, our bank accounts, credit cards, took out loans, and we scraped together enough money to get two small fishing boats. And 44 people from 17 different countries gathered in Cyprus in the summer of 2008. And we did this training. We tried to envision every scenario that we could possibly think of. What might, what might Israel do to us? Would they fire missiles at us? Would they sink our ship? Maybe even look like, make it look like it was an accident or we did it or we were stupid, naive people. Would they open fire? Might some people get really injured, killed? Might there be a long standoff at sea? We might run out of water. At best, maybe they'll just arrest us and at least nobody would be injured. And it became clear and we told people, you know what, we can't guarantee your safety. So if you're not prepared to possibly be injured or maybe even killed, don't step foot on those boats. So on August 22nd, 2008, we launched those two boats. And we set sail for Gaza. And it was gonna take us over 30 hours to get there because our boats were so slow. Um, but spirits were high. People got really, really sick, but spirits were high. Then we get to this point, I went out to look because now we're getting close to the shore, at least you could see the Gaza skyline, and as we got closer, you could see these thousands and thousands of people that just came out to meet us, and fishermen jumped in their boats to come out to us, and young boys jumped in the water to swim out to us, and when we got to shore, just people were scrambling to, to touch us, to hug us, to talk to us, we had to have security keep people back, and I was thinking, Gosh, this was, must be what it's like to be a rock star or something because they were like... And all of this really humbling show of love and appreciation, to understand it, it wasn't because we were carrying humanitarian aid with us. Our boats were small. Our boats barely carried us. We had 200 hearing aids that were donated and we had balloons for kids. That's what we were carrying with us. So it wasn't like people were scrambling to get this aid. It was that Palestinians had never seen someone do that before, just stand up to the Israeli military and government and say, no, we're not gonna let you do this. And so as they were jumping up and down and, and cheering that we had broken the siege, we realized that you know, this can't be a one-time only thing because we didn't break the siege with this one mission. We overcame the blockade once, but maybe we can seriously break the siege. We just have to leave the same way we came and come back again, and hopefully with more people, and then leave and come back again. And if we manage to do that, we will have opened a sea route to Gaza, and then we will have, in effect, broken the siege. And that's what we promised to do. And so a few days later, we left Gaza, taking out with us. We left internationals, I think it was about eight at the time. We left them in Gaza to restart the international solidarity movement there. And in their place, we took out Palestinians. 
without asking permission from Israel. And it was the first time that Palestinians were able to leave their own homeland without having to go through this humiliating process of getting permission and going through checks in order to leave. And we thought maybe now people would see that we can do this and organizations that have more resources than we do would come, would sign on, but none of that happened. People though were motivated. People motivated and suddenly felt, you know what, there, it, this can be done. And so people contributed to our efforts and one kind man donated a, a boat, a small yacht, because those wooden boats were not gonna make it across the Mediterranean again. So we got the small yacht and we were able to make the voyage four more times back and forth to Gaza. So five times between August and December 2008, we sailed to Gaza. Then on December 27, 2008, Israel began a massive bombing air campaign, which launched what became known as Operation Cast Lead, a 22-day campaign that saw the death of over 1,400 Palestinians. On the second day, was well, December 27th, on December 29th, we launched an emergency mission. And this time, we were trying to carry as much aid as we could. Medical supplies, really. Our boat fit about three tons of medical supplies. And then we had four doctors. We were trying to take in doctors and journalists. Doctors to try to help the doctors in Gaza and journalists because foreign journalists weren't being allowed into Gaza. And in the middle of the night on December 30th, our boat was rammed by an Israeli warship and left to sink. Luckily, it didn't sink, and the captain was able to get it back to a Lebanese port. And here we are thinking, so what do we do now? One thing we knew is that we're not going to back down, and we decided we're going to go again. And we were able to muster enough resources to get another boat and sail two weeks later, still during Operation Cast Lead, carrying more supplies and more volunteers. That boat was almost capsized and never made it. And we tried one more time, a few months later. By that time, you know, the assault on Gaza had ended. But Israel had not opened the borders to Gaza. You know, you would think after this massive attack, you'd at least open a little bit so people can rebuild their lives, get in some of the supplies they needed to rebuild, some of the experts that need to come in and help people recover. Nothing. Nothing, so that by June 2009, people were still living on the rubble of their homes because thousands of homes and schools and mosques and hospitals were damaged or destroyed. So we decided we're going to go again, and we're going to take in construction supplies and school supplies. Israel intercepted that boat also, arrested everyone, and so we never made it. But at the same time, we didn't want to give up because the violence perpetrated in the occupied territories is much more than we had experienced. And we didn't want to give in to this notion that military might is stronger than the rights we were fighting for. So we just decided that we need a new strategy. What will that be? Instead of sending one boat, we'll send a flotilla. Now how we were gonna build a flotilla, we didn't really know. But that's what we were gonna do and that's what we set out to do. We were gonna to go to all these countries and all these people and ask their help and ask them to join us on a very grassroots level to send as many boats as we can get to Gaza. In December, I think it was, in 2009, a Turkish organization, they said that they would commit a boat to our flotilla. So we were super excited because here's this big humanitarian aid organization, and that's what we wanted, these big organizations, even like the UN. You know, you can't get your books and paper into Gaza, well, send them on a boat. Challenge, don't, challenge this blockade. But traveling together, we were three cargo ships and three passenger ships, almost 10,000 tons of cargo, mainly building supplies, but also medical supplies, and 700 people from 36 different countries. 
And on the evening of May 30th, it was about 11, 11.30 at night, the Israeli Navy radios us. And again and again they repeated that we are to turn around and they'd be willing to use all necessary force to keep us out of Gaza. We kept sailing forward, albeit at a slower pace, and I just kept repeating that we're unarmed civilians. Don't use force against us. Don't use force against us. They disappeared off the radio for a few hours, and then about 4 o'clock in the morning, one of our colleagues that we had on watch yells down to us, they're coming. I was on a ship called the Challenger. It was a small American flag boat. It was sailing very close to our biggest ship. The biggest ship was called the Mavi Marmana. It had about 580 of the 700 passengers on that boat. So, you know, we thought that this was going to be one of the scenarios. So we got ready, we put on our life vests, and I went outside on deck. And so I could see the beginnings of the attack on the Marmara. These zodiacs filled with soldiers, masked and armed, were coming up alongside of this big boat and firing. Just repeated gunfire, gunfire. And, you know, I spent most of my time, I spend most of my time in the West Bank and in demonstrations. And so I know what gunfire sounds like, whether this is a rubber coated steel bullet or this was a live ammunition. But I couldn't tell what those bullets were. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, like me, okay, I'm used to it, but these people must be terrified. It was 4 o'clock in the morning. We were still 10 hours from Gaza at the rate we were traveling. You know, they could have waited till daylight, come upon the boats in a less aggressive way, in a way that wouldn't have caused the chaos that it did. I don't know why they attacked us the way they did, but these soldiers come up along the boat and firing and sound bombs. And then a helicopter, a military helicopter up above. It was a full-on military assault. Our small boat decided to take off. And the idea was, we had decided previously that we would all stay together, but we thought that maybe we could delay the boarding of our boats, outrun them a little bit, at least until we could get message out that we were under attack. And indeed, the captain of the Mavi Marmara told us, radioed us and said, try to get away, try to tell the world that we're under attack. And so we sped off. Unfortunately, we were not able to get through on our satellite phones. And after about 10 minutes of this chase, these two zodiacs filled with soldiers overtook our boat. And one of the first things they went after is all of our recording equipment. Cameras, phones. You know, everyone on our boat was at least okay. On the Mavi Marmara, nine of our colleagues were killed and 50 injured. We immediately asked for an independent investigation and we asked our countries to demand that Israel turn over this recording equipment because this is evidence and this is tampering with evidence. And we wanted an independent international investigation to come in and question all you want and try to figure out what happened. Israel refused. They said that they can carry out their own investigation. Nevertheless, the UN Human Rights Council commissioned a three-judge panel to investigate. And these judges renowned international law practitioners and scholars. A former judge of the International Criminal Court, a former chief prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone, and a former member of the UN Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Israel still didn't cooperate, and so the judges couldn't talk to any Israeli soldiers or any Israeli commanders or anything like that, but they did their investigation as best they could, and they interviewed about 110 witnesses and looked at all available evidence. They didn't have the evidence that Israel had confiscated, but talked to different organizations and human rights organizations, and they issued their report. Many important findings in this report. The first one is that a humanitarian crisis did exist in Gaza. Because Israel was saying that there's no humanitarian crisis, people aren't starving. A humanitarian crisis did exist in Gaza. And because a humanitarian crisis exists, existed in Gaza, Israel's blockade was unlawful and could not be sustained in law no matter what the grounds for this blockade. Second, our flotilla did not constitute an imminent threat 
to Israel and was not part of any kind of war effort against Israel. And therefore, intercepting our flotilla was unlawful, especially in international waters. And because intercepting our flotilla was unlawful, any use of force by Israel to carry out this interception was unlawful. They also found enough evidence, they say, to pursue prosecutions for willful killing, torture, willfully causing great bodily harm. They found that likely six of the nine volunteers that were killed, they were likely executed. You know, no action has been taken on this report. Israel did conduct its own investigation, and they found that everything that they did was lawful. And if Israel thought that they were going to break us with this level of violence that they used, they're wrong. Because more countries are joining us, and more people, and I expect this flotilla to be twice as big as the last one, and we hope to set sail in about two and a half months. And we're going to set sail even if, hopefully, a representative government comes to power in Egypt and maybe they'll open the border or the Rafah crossing, and so people in Gaza can get some breathing room. We're going to set sail because this is not just about Gaza. Yes, we want to end the crisis there. We want people to be able to lead somewhat of a normal life, if not total, until at least they can achieve liberation. So this is all part of an unjust system that needs to be changed. That needs to be changed if we're ever going to see peace. If these talks between the children that I was working with are ever going to bear fruit, then we have to change the political system that's dividing them. But it's also not just about Gaza and all of Palestine. It's about what we as people do every single day of our lives. What can we do when we know of an injustice? What is the role that we play to create the world that we want to live in and that we want our children to live in and our children's children to live in? That's why we'll sail.